Looking for inspiring destinations, incredible places to stay, and the most exciting bucket list experiences to travel to next? Welcome to Destination Everywhere with hospitality and travel entrepreneurs, Todd Bloodworth and Andy McNeil. Having traveled to over 100 countries, Todd and Andy bring you unique perspectives with celebrities in the know, hospitality experts, and native connoisseurs to discover must-dos and inspirational destinations to plan your next trip for business or pleasure. So pack your bags and get ready as we bring you Destination Everywhere with Todd and Andy. Castles, pubs, and finding love. The Emerald Isle, a place of unfettered beauty, warm people, and mystical legends, we explore this island from the western shores of Galway to the eastern edges of its largest city, Dublin. It's no wonder why this jewel of a country is inspiration for so much poetry and lore. Its sweeping green valleys that dive into crystal blue seas has brought traveler and adventurer alike for thousands of years. Its people are kind, welcoming, and always ready with the story of times gone by. Whether you're coming for business or a personal adventure, Ireland will never disappoint. Today we'll discover a lover's matchmaking festival, what to do in Dublin and residing in a castle. We are joined by a two-time national storytelling champion, Martine de Gogan, and the gracious host of Dromolin Castle Hotel, Mark Nolan, both of who will share their love and passion for this ancient land while providing bucket list ideas for even the most discerning traveler. So off we head to the Emerald Isle. With a bit of luck, we might just find the adventure of a lifetime. Welcome to this episode of Destination Everywhere, Ireland, Castles, Pubs, and Finding Love. Welcome everyone to Destination Everywhere. I'm Andy McNeil, and I'm here with Todd Bloworth, and this week we are doing Ireland. And I can't tell you how excited I am. I'm uh, of Irish heritage and I've been there, wow, probably eight or nine times. Um, and it's one of those places that is truly, truly magical. And um, Todd, we're going to cover north, south, east and west today. Um, we're going to uh, talk a lot about the people, the culture, as well as some great uh, bucket list items. And we also have a fantastic uh, bucket list uh, venue, don't we? We do, yes. And is it? Ireland or Ireland? Ir it's Ireland. Ireland. I guess it depends if you uh, are from Ireland or not. Depending on the area of the country, it's a little different everywhere, but um, we love the Irish brogue. It's um, definitely classic and um, something that uh, uh, people love to hear. So I can't do it. You can do it pretty good. No, I, you know what? I'm afraid during this podcast, I might try to uh, accidentally break into, <laughs> into trying to speak with an Irish accent and I might fail miserably. Yeah, you but, might, um, you might, you it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like, you, you can't say lucky charms without going lucky charms. It's <laughs> <laughs> just what you do. Well, we're going to be talking about Dublin <laughs> and Galway and the ring of Kerry and um, all the deep and rich history um, that Ireland affords there. I mean, we could do 10 or 20 shows in Ireland. I'm excited because I'm going to really um, hit on some of the bucket list, um, uh, not only uh, things to do, and we're going to kind of stay away from the, the traditional stuff. We're going to uh, pick bucket list items that um, are, can really make your, 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 your trip uh, an incredible experience, and then also talk about um, a venue that is, uh, can be used for business or pleasure that will um, truly knock your socks off. Yeah, maybe if someone um, if someone has interest, if listeners want to, you know, maybe one day we can zoom in on a very specific area and just do an entire show dedicated to that area, whether it's in Ireland or anywhere else. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, anyways, um, today we are going to focus on all of Ireland because there's so many great places to see, uh, but not Northern Ireland. That's an, a show within and of itself. It's a beautiful area as well. But today we're going to be focusing on. Um, uh, areas in Dublin and Southern uh, Ireland, and then also in the kind of the, uh, the Western side of this uh, country uh, around the Galway Shannon area. So it's going to be going to be pretty incredible. Todd, what venue are we looking at this this week? Oh, we've got, uh, we actually got a very special guest that's uh, going to be on in a minute. And um, the venue is Dromolin Castle. And Dromolin Ooh. Castle is, uh, I think, about a 10 minute uh, ride from Shannon Airport. So it's got easy accessibility. So um, we're actually got uh, 
um, Mark Nolan, who's the, uh, the managing director of Dromolin Castle, and um, he's got uh, some great insight for us. So we're looking forward to hearing from him. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to get started. Um, let's, uh, let's kick this whole uh, Ireland episode off on Destination Everywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are really excited to have our next guest here. We have Mark Nolan, who is uh, no experience to uh, luxury properties in Ireland. And Mark is the managing director of Dromolin Castle. And uh, Dromolin Castle has actually gotten a couple of special awards this year. Uh, Travel and Leisure's top 100 uh, resort hotels in Ireland. Wow, and that's UK. incredible. Uh, congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. And, and TripAdvisor's 2020 Traveler's Choice, best of the best putting you guys in the top 1% of hotels in the world. So congratulations on both of those uh, accolades. That's wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed, Tom. Thank you. Well, and we just kind of want to get into it. You know, obviously we want to kind of project a, a bucket list experience for, you know, listeners, if they've been to Ireland or if they haven't, but your property, Dromolin Castle, and I'm, you probably say it much better than me, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mark, can we hear you say it just so we get it right? It's going to. Yeah, I mean, no, Todd, fun. you're very close, very close. Dromolin Castle. Dromoland. It Most sounds North much America better. Struggle with that. <laughs> Dromoland. It Dromoland sounds East, much Dromoland better for Mark. M much better for Mark, for sure. <laughs> well, and, and obviously, you know, there's, there's a history here and there's a romanticism about going and staying in a castle. And uh, so why don't you start off by giving us a little bit of the history of the castle and how you ended up being there? Okay. Well, the history briefly of the castle is it was the O'Brien stronghold. Um, uh, direct descendants of the first High King of Ireland who was killed in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Um, uh, Lord H. Quinn, Conor H. Quinn still lives on the estate with his wife Helen and they sold the, the property uh, in 87 uh, and it was bought by an American investor, uh, Bernard McDonough, who was inveigled by some local Shannon guys to buy this castle He's, he really treated it as especially a haven for a North American market only. He opened in April, closed again in September, uh, just did not want any Irish. It, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable. Um, but he, he did a great job in the castle. He really made it an attractive proposition to come to. And he built quite a few hotels around the Shannon area uh, as a result of his involvement with the, with the castle. Um, he had a very clever marketing perspective, and that was... You know, when people were quoted way back in the day, that would be $6 to stay in the castle and they'd swoon at the price of it. And I'm, I'm talking them. He'd say, wow. well, I have another <laughs> inn down the road. So uh, <laughs> at about a quarter of the price. So he was, he, he was always on for capture. So he, he was a great guy. He sold then to a group of North American investors headed up by a guy called Bill Dowling, who got a lot of Solomon Brothers uh, involved in the property. And they did a complete refurb, reopened again. And, in uh, 1987. And really that's been the property, it's been in the same ownership since. We have a lot of proud North Americans. In actual fact, I'm the only Irish investor now as it stands. Gotcha. Wow. And t tell us um, exactly where it's located. Is, uh, you know, Ireland, um, I know it's on the West Coast, but we're exactly on the West Coast. It's West Coast. It's about 10 minute ride from Shannon International Airport, which is a wonderful benefit to us. Uh, obviously, at the moment, uh, you know, the world we live in, we don't have too much activity there. But generally speaking, right through and hopefully from next season on, we'll have Delta, Aer Lingus, United, all flying in daily services, certainly from May to September, October. So that's a, it's a, it's a big attraction. Uh, we're right on the coast. We're about 40 minutes transfer time from the Hinch Golf Course, Bally Bunyan, Tralee. So if, for, it's a golfer's haven. Now, that's not saying that we... That's all we do. We have our own 18-hole championship golf course and good golf academy and practice facilities. But it's not. I mean, it's all about the authentic Irish castle. We are the real thing. Yeah. So if you have a, bu you have a bucket list item, if you have a bucket list item to golf at a castle, you, you guys are the place to go. I, I think we're absolutely the place to go. <laughs> our signature hole is the seventh. It's a par three. And the backdrop is the castle. And on a wow. sunny day... And we've been getting plenty of sunny days this year for some reason. It's just breathtaking. Yeah. It's nearly the back. It's the other side of your backdrop, Andy, actually. <laughs> wow. I need to go. I yeah, need no, to go. <laughs> and now that we're talking about activities, because you guys also cater well to families and, and children. And I was looking at some of the activities that you have, you know, including, you know, the adult side, falconry and uh, shooting and archery and 
uh, those kinds of things, which are amazing to me. But what about the children also? Yeah, well, the fa- all those activities you listed, Todd, are also for the, for the children as well. And we do a lot of family programs and activities based around falconry because it is an amazing experience. And it's hard, for, it's hard to explain it until you do it. It's one of those things. But we have, at the moment, 35 birds of prey. We have three full-time falconers, so it's a huge activity on the estate very popular. And once people come back to say, gosh, I get it now, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of, kind of quirky activities, but very popular. Do you actually get to hold the falcon on your wrist? Yeah, absolutely. You get a wow. talent, you get your sleeve and you, you'll get the birds to, and it's amazing. I mean, it's down to how many ounces they feed the bird a day as to how fast they're going to fly. It, it's extraordinary. They've weighed scales down to grams nearly as to how and, much they feed them. And then how long, how long is that entire experience if someone wants to come and do it? Is it one afternoon? hour. It goes from one hour if you want to do a trek, a trek with the birds. Two hours and we go off the estate, up the estate, up to what we call Mahon Castle, which is one of yes. the original castles that ruins that's on the grounds of the estate. I've been to Munhollen. It's beautiful. And a lot of history there. How, how, old, is that, how, how old is that castle? Uh, Mah- Mahon Castle will be something around 1650. So it, it's old. <laughs> And so uh, let's talk about some of the, the food or, and, and the venues for food and drink, uh, you sure. know, because obviously um, you guys have uh, also, I heard, do you have a partnership with an Irish whiskey? Is- yes. Yeah. JJ Curry, we have a limited edition. We produced 100 bottles of whiskey and we were to uh, bring it onto the market this year. But everything as it is, we are kind of taking a little bit easier. We were going to release the whole stock, but we're just going to release 50 bottles this year. It's a fabulous whiskey, blended uh, by JJ Curry, uh, and it's it's a very unique type product. Um, there's quite a bit of that. We're also partnered with Dingle Whiskey as well, who also produced the gin. Dingle is a little further south in yep. County Kerry, and they're pretty renowned for their gin and whiskey. And we also have a, a barrel of whiskey down there, which we're going to bring on. It's a matter of the more it matures, the better the quality, the less the volume. So. What we want to do is have a product that's really, really strong. So we're reducing down our amount of bottles. But it's, it, to be honest with you, it's my deputy GM, Simon Hodgson, who has a real, real interest in whiskeys. And he, oh, wow. he's, really, he's really taken to that. And he's- T- Todd and him are brothers then, because Todd has a huge, <laughs> huge- well, that's, you know, why he's, that's why he's asking the question. Well, I am, you know, and it's got to be an Irish whiskey. And um, so I'm, I'm really curious about that. That's why the room that's behind me is actually the cocktail bar, which used to be, I think, a study. And, that's um, right. you know, and I kind of fantasized, you know, about there's a, a fireplace right back there. And, you know, I, I, you know, just sitting in there with a fire going and having a, a, a little glass of whiskey, maybe listening to someone sing a song or so. I, I think well, that would be, that's a dream well, Todd, right there. Todd, just beside the fireplace, be up, be, behind your left ear, is a, a show, is a case that we completely stocked with our whiskies. They are all Irish whiskies. I think there's 48 different blends of whiskies, and they're all Irish produced. And we do flights. We do a nice kind of in the evening time. If you want to do it, we'll give you a tasting of three. And it's oh, hugely nice. popular. Irish whiskey is really making its way in the world. Oh yeah, it's it's already been sold to me. So I'm 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 I've bought into it. So uh, <laughs> that's great. I can't okay, wait to brilliant. try to try the one that you're, you're making right now when it gets released. So someone can come to the castle and l- literally like check five or six things off a bucket list, right? That staying at a castle, playing on a championship golf course, doing falconry, doing uh, Irish whiskey uh, flights in a, an old study. So, I mean, this is just an incredible place. Now you, you actually uh, worked at Astrid Castle as well. And I've been to Astrid as well. Um, and I'm sure some of our listeners have, um, Mark. Can you tell the differences? What are they going to experience? And Ashford's a beautiful property as well. I, what are the What I, are the differences? Ashford is a stunning property, and I suppose, strictly speaking, Andy, we are uh, somewhat aligned. The, 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 geographically, we're not. We're two hour transfer time. Right. Ashford is right on the shores of Loch Harrop, a stunning 83 bedroom castle property. It's owned by Red Carnation, and they have invested incredible amounts of money to make it an absolutely fabulous property. Um, so it, it's probably a tad more formal than we are. Um, okay. We work together. We do legendary programs together right through the winter. So we're the best of friends. The GM up there was my deputy in Dromolan. But I'd say Red Carnation are a little bit more formal than we are. Uh, we're gotcha. more spontaneous. We like people 
we, we like, we, we really uh, employ people that we feel have got that spontaneity. The, 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 the comments that a lot of we would get from the guests that stay, you know, we're coming to a castle, we're a little bit apprehensive because, you know, the, the prospect is quite daunting staying in a castle, but we got there uh, and we got it. We, we know what you're about. And so that's, that's yeah. so nice for us to hear. It means that we blended that nice feeling of a formal castle on the one hand, but, you know, you're treated like you're, you're home away from home. And that's all our ambition is. Well, I was like, Mark, if, if you know, you have uh, some, let's just call them discerning guests, and they want just uh, an amazing VIP experience, you know, on your property. What, what are some things that you do to kind of really enhance that? Whether it's, you know, uh, the, the best suite or room that you have, uh, special uh, dinner events or things like that. What do you guys offer for someone says, you know, I, this is my 50th wedding anniversary. I want it to be over the top special. What's something that you guys do or offer for people like that? Uh, well, one of the things we have taught is a, a garden suite, which is a fully equipped kitchen. It's got good storage space. It's got its own little garden and it's interconnected to another room. So if you're a family, you've got that. And we will cater that room. If you would like to do, you know, a fully served dinner in that room with the chef cooking in your kitchen, you've also got a golf buggy at your disposal to, 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 to tour the estate. Because remember, there's 500 acres of woodland, some of these oh, specimen wow. trees that you won't see anywhere in the world. And that was That's Lord Inchiquin, who was a visionary at the time, the original Lord Inchiquin, who imported trees from all over the world on his travels. So we oh, have fantastic. got some amazing tree collection. But that aside, the cooking part of it would be obviously the, a key element of that. And our executive chef, uh, Dave McCann, will really personalize menus. The whole thing, as I say, is about personalizing experiences, going the extra yard. Or suddenly they're saying, we like to be spontaneous. It's funny. Even when we're fully fledged and we're primarily a North American property, you know, that's been absolutely honest. But, you know, people don't mind spending $1,500 or $2,000 to stay in a suite. And they love it. But what they'll remember is the two glasses of wine that were bought for them with the, by Danny in the bar. Or Frank in the bar says, I'll sing you a song. We've always got a singing barman. Who, if things are a little bit quiet in the evening. He's a bit of a croner, a bit of a Frank Sinatra croner. He doesn't sing Irish ballads. But suddenly, if it's quiet in the bar, he might suddenly break into song, and people are amazed by this. It's just, it's all about spontaneity. It's all about the surprise element. Or somebody goes down to the spa and say, did you enjoy that spa treatment with your husband? That's with our compliments. We, you know, and, and just that kind of nice thing. And it doesn't matter to these people. They, you know, being absolutely honest, most of our people have plenty of money. They don't need me to comp them. But it's the surprise element of them. Say, look, you're great customers. We love you. Here's your prize. You know, absolutely. And that kind of thing. The other thing we've introduced in the last couple of months is uh, a, a daily newsletter. It goes under your door about five o'clock in the morning, tells you what the weather's going to be like next day, which we've got a little bit more courageous about because the weather's getting better here. Instead of telling them it's going to be rain and everything. But we do a Sudoku you might need to do it. Sudoku, Instagram, photograph of the day. And there's little rewards. You get a cocktail dropped up to your room at six o'clock. Just something we're always trying to keep people kind of thinking and saying, gosh, is there something, you know, but as I say, the small gestures, you know, guys, you're in the business, you know what it's all about travel. The small gestures mean the most. So, so Mark, and, and you just mentioned, and you were talking about those things you do for, uh, for your clients, for your guests that um, really kind of extend, uh, uh, it, it's more of a, the way you would treat family than, than somebody who's, who's at your, your, your property temporarily, you know, throwing out, you know, a nice gift, uh, you know, have a good night, these drinks are on me. Let me pay for your meal. Um, and that kind of develops a real sense of, of um, loyalty uh, with families and friends and, you know, returning customers. We've been doing more kind of complimentary things, just nice things that are not huge costs, but really add value to the proposition of coming to stay with us. That's, that's so, so, Mark, when, when people outside of the property, what, what can people experience or what would you recommend they do around the area? Well, I mean, it's, you know, depending on what they, what they want to do, Todd, I mean, if people are cynically, you've got the Cliffs of Moher, the Burn, which are two of the infamous things to see in Ireland. So we're very fortunate yeah, literally to have them cool. both within a 40 minute transfer time. Uh, we've also got King John's Castle, Bonratti Castle and Folk Park, which is a wonderfully done uh, development of Castle and they do nightly banquets, not this year, unfortunately, but from next year on, they'll be back in business. And there's some fabulous heritage sites. So we're awash with history, the whole region, and spectacular scenery. Um, 
you know, I mentioned golf earlier. I don't want that golf to become the, the whole key, but it is certainly a great location for golfers. But apart from golfers, there's so much to do. And the one feedback we would have historically, Todd, would be people say, do you know what? We only stayed one night because we are so near and so convenient to the airport. They say, okay, let's stay the first night or let's stay the last night. And they say, gosh, we're so sorry we didn't stay the two nights. Because apart from the falconry, there's clay target shooting. We've got our own lake fully stocked with trout. With, you know, so fishing is great with the ghillie. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, there's lots of bits and pieces to do. We have a great spa, great leisure center. So people just want to chill and just relax. And they do get it within an hour or two. They're, they're in the groove. We'll get them in the groove and they're just relaxed. So they do say, that's fantastic. I'm so sorry well, to stay longer. Well, I hope a lot of our listeners uh, plan to come to your uh, property. Um, it sounds unbelievably fantastic. And the amount of things that you can do in a, just a short drive. Um, in Galway is how far from the... Go, Galway uh, is about 45 minutes. Property? About 45 minutes. Okay, and so as you say, it. Andy, it's a fabulous city. Just park the car and walk everywhere. Yeah. And Limerick. Limerick exactly, is 30 so. minutes from us. Another fabulous city. So, awesome. so as, as someone who lives in the area, what are your favorite things to do personally uh, when you get a little time off, which probably isn't that much, but uh, uh, I, I, I love to come down. I love to come down to the house I'm in here. This is our, our kind of retreat house in La Hinch. Um, it's just wonderful. I love to walk the beach, uh, play a little golf, go to a nice restaurant. There's so many fabulous restaurants in this whole area. And, and, you know, that's the one thing, Todd, you were alluding to, to food in Ireland earlier. The quality of food has just become just the most amazing improvement in quality. And I think even this whole situation, everybody's focused more on what they do in terms of creating that, that quality experience. I mean, it, it really is superb. Even your pop-up down the village of, of La Hinch here, you have a pop-up truck that opens on a Thursday to Sunday and does these gourmet burgers that are to die for. And you've got our local, uh, our local um, bakery who closed, who would be, you know, just doing very little and they're packed out because they produce this such wonderful quality sourdough bread and all those kind of things. Just everybody's focused on quality. And I think, as I say, that's really going to add to the experience for next year. People coming, they're going to have a great experience and great quality throughout. That's great. That's great. So, uh, Mark, are you what? ready for our uh, uh, rapid-fire questions for you? Okay. I'm a little bit worried about uh, one of them, but let's give it a go. <laughs> All right. So we do this to uh, share with our listeners uh, things that they may not think about travel and um, get it from the experts. So uh, we want to hear uh, kind of your personal experiences, and, uh, and uh, here we go. So the first one is, have you ever completed any of your bucket list items? If so, what was it? Okay, um, for my 25th wedding anniversary, uh, I'm married to Maria 31 years now. We went, I, there's a very well-known hotelier who writes a journal in the UK called Mary Gostolo, the Gostolo Report. I know you may not be familiar with it, Andy, but it's a, it's a pretty well-read thing in the, in the hospitality industry. But anyway, I contacted Mary, she's a super woman. And I said, Mary, in your wildest dreams, 10 days in India. This is, uh, this is six years ago. And we stayed in every uh -huh. Taj hotel. We left our luggage on the, at the airport in Shannon, uh, our local airport, and we didn't touch our luggage until it was back in Shannon. We just didn't touch it. We had the nice. most amazing experience. And, you know, it was just wonderful. Nothing. It was full of surprises. When so I was talking stay to the every airport, Taj. Every, yeah. Well, not every Taj in India, so but every Taj within our program. Falaknuma Palace. Great. If you ever get to India, do not miss it. Uh, it is, and it's yeah. so full of surprises. Just to give you a quick idea, uh, the following morning, <laughs> you've got your own kind of butler, a wonderful lady we had who was trained up by Taj. And the Irish Times and the Irish Independent were on our doorstep the following morning. I mean, just little things like that. Oh, I mean, nice. I, I could bore you with like the that. wonderful things they did. So I've learned a bit from that. Oh, that's Can fantastic. You Say the name of that pro Can you say the name of that property one more yeah, time? Yeah, Falak, Falak, Falak Numa Palace. And it's kind of made, it's actually quite an, quite an industrial area of India, uh, but it is, it, it was originally uh, a castle to the, to the Mughals. And they, it, it literally is a castle and there's rooms that they would bring you into to show you the scripts of hundreds and hundreds of years old. I mean, 
we think we're all, I mean, India, it's the most extraordinary experience. If any of your listeners get to do it, do it. That's amazing. It. Okay, number two, if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be? Paris. No, no, Paris. no second guessing there, yeah. yeah. Paris just love right. it, love the feel. That's, that's a good one. I uh, love their arrogance. <laughs> Love that you can walk everywhere. I, I walk forever. <laughs> yeah, so you guys a great answer. And the, if and you the could Bristol, travel with someone, if you're treating yourself, or, the Bristol in Paris is the most amazing experience you'll ever have. The property, the, the Bristol, no Bristol. problem. If you could travel with someone yeah. infamous or famous, who would it be? Yeah, we were trying. We were trying to think about that. I mean, I mean, I was going to say something corny, Andy, and say that as a hotelier, I don't get to travel as much as I'd like. And my, my greatest travel buddies are my family. But that being said, if I was to have somebody, I think travel is all about fun and having, as they say in Ireland, the crack without, without any kind of... Yep. So I was kind of saying, Freddie Flintock, who's an English guy, you may or may not know him, but he's a great, great personality. Or David Becker, they're just great fun, would really kind of make the, make the occasion. I, yeah, I, I, I think, think Becker would be, be awesome. Okay, next one. When you're packing for a trip, yeah. what is something you pack that may surprise our listeners? Andy, that was a real tough one. Um, I, you know, and they're going to say, oh, that's boring, Mark. And I really did this, got a lot of thought. For my uh, 60th, I, and I wanted to try and bring that in, for my 60th birthday, we went to California <laughs> last year. and We stayed in the Beverly Hills Hotel. Edward Maddy and his team could not have been kinder to us. They celebrated. It was just an amazing event. But one of the gifts I got while I was there were Bose sunglasses, but they're also speakers. You know, you can tune them into your iPhone. Uh -huh. And it's wonderful. Even though yeah. in Ireland, where it doesn't that. look, Ireland is not that sunny. And you're walking <laughs> along with your sunglasses, they think, that guy's crazy. He needs to go into a home. But I never travel without them anymore. They're just wonderful to have. And the other thing I never travel without is a corkscrew. Because you'd be amazed at hotels, but suddenly, you know. A corkscrew, that's a good one. But, and you, you ring That's down for a course and they say, oh, that bastard, he's there. Somebody shoot this other. This guy's not drinking our booze. <laughs> that, that, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Yeah, one more. What is your most memorable experience in Ireland? Um, I, I think as an experience, and this is when I was in Ashford Castle, that's many years ago, uh, they used to close the hotel for the winter and for me to learn a bit more about food, which as you can see, I'm quite keen on food. Um, I did a, a 13 week full time, 13 week uh, cookery course in Ballymaloo. Now I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a very famous and well-renowned Myrtle Allen, the late I've Myrtle Allen. She was one of the great cooks of Ireland of all time. And her daughter, Dorina, and subsequently another daughter has now got involved but I learned, I learned how to cook properly there for 13 weeks with 11 other ladies and myself. And it was the finest experience one could ever want in every respect. So, That's great. So when you're cooking a meal for your wife, what is, what is your go-to meal that you cook for your wife? Uh, it's funny. I'm cooking on Saturday. We're having a dinner party here in La Hinch. And we got some lovely fresh lobster literally locally yesterday. Um, no, nobody but us are buying lobster, so it's at an all-time low price. And we've got a great local butcher. We're doing fillet steaks and fillet steak and lobster. I tend to cook a lot of chicken and fish, but this is kind of for a dinner party. And we, we eat quite a bit, even though my daughters don't agree. We, we like a lot of vegetarian dishes. We love lots of pasta. And, uh, but there's so much in Ireland. There's so much. The produce is so brilliant. that no matter what, even if you're the worst cook in the world, you could make a mess of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, well Mark, and, and we'd so be remiss, you know, uh, we're, you have one other question. I, I did. We'd be remiss if we didn't say uh, your your mother is a hundred years old, correct? She's one hundred and one. She's one hundred and two next June. She's got to be being the best cook of all time, and she never. She her hand. She you know she never. You'd say, "Mom, how'd you make that dish?" Or what? She'd say, "Look, this my hand." She was one of the best cooks of all time, and still at one hundred and two has a ferocious and wonderful appetite. It's great. Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. So, but uh, Mark, you know, again, thank you so much for joining us. This has been yes. uh, very enlightening. We're very excited to to get back on the airplanes and and get over and and see your yeah. property. Yeah, we, we we miss you. We miss you so much, and we really want to have you back. And please, Todd and Andy, you're staying with staying with my compliments the next time you're staying in Des Moines, and we'll give you the time of your life. 
Well, thank well, you thank very you so much. much. We appreciate Absolute it. We'll take pleasure. you up on we that. Can't wait for, we can't wait for everybody to see your um, fabulous property. So again, Mark, Mark Nolan, Managing Director of Dromolin Castle. Uh, thank you. We'll be right back after these words. Thanks indeed. Thank you, gentlemen. At AMI, we're passionate about meeting connections that change lives. For over 20 years, we have traveled our clients all over the globe, supporting their business goals and helping them stand apart. From hotel sourcing to audiovisual magic, we'll make your corporate meeting or event second to none. Go to AmericanMeetings.com to learn more. American Meetings, AMI, meeting planning perfected. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. And again, we want to thank Mark Nolan, who is the Managing Director of Dromolin Castle. So thank you for all of that wonderful information about what is, is definitely a bucket list item to, to go there. Yeah, I want to do falconry for sure. I want, I want to go there and do falconry. That's got to be just an incredible experience. Well, it's all birds of prey too. So it's the falcons and they had owls and um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. So, and he, uh, he buys entire groups of people drinks in the bar. So that's another reason to go to his, uh, <laughs> to go to the castle, <laughs> right? You had to stumble back to your, uh, I'm to, sold to your suite, but <laughs> yeah, well, at least you're not driving. That's the important part. Oh, uh, it was, it sounds like a, just a great go. It sounds like a, you can go almost any time of year too. There's things to do, uh, uh, whenever. So just incredible. Well, I think the thing is with Ireland, you know, if you don't mind, you know, some, some rainy days, some overcast days, which, you know, I don't when I travel, you know, I love the intimate fireplaces and the small streets. I don't mind walking in a puddle every once in a while. Um, but uh, Mark, what Mark was saying is, is the weather's been absolutely gorgeous over there right now. So um, yeah. I guess you never know what you're going to get. Well, I mean, it's a really good point. So obviously it's kind of like the West, Western United States where, you know, it's really, really gorgeous from, you know, late May to, um, you know, early September. But I've been, I've been in Ireland um, all the way into November and it's absolutely gorgeous. And um, it just gets dark early. It's Northern. So you have to be prepared for that. Like, you know, it gets dark at four, but the crowds and the, um, and the deals are great. So there's, no, there's not a whole lot of crowds and the deals you can get later in the year in Ireland are really, really good when you go off season. So if you're on a budget, you know, look at, you know, October, November, March, obviously you have St. Patrick's Day and what a great experience to experience St. Patrick's Day in Ireland is, would be a great thing as well. Well, and, and, you know, let's talk about when you think of Ireland, um, there's a couple of things you think about. Obviously, you know, St. Patrick's Day is one. And I, I don't know if that's bigger in the United States now, but um, it definitely is uh, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, but there's something else you think about when you think of Ireland. And what do you think about Andy? Maybe you can guess this. Uh, probably for you going to a pub and having a, a pint. A pint in a pub. Well, those yes. two things, you're absolutely right. And, and there's a pint on every corner. And there's backup yeah. pints for the backup pints that are in front of you. Yeah, but you can't swing, you can't swing a leprechaun without hitting a pub in, uh, in Ireland. <laughs> Well, and, and uh, also, you know, when you talk about pints, Guinness, obviously Guinness is, uh, is, is the beer in Ireland. It's, um, uh, it's based in Dublin. And uh, so that's definitely, I would say for those first timers going to Ireland is the Guinness, um, the Guinness storehouse is, is a must see on your list where they'll teach you how to do the perfect pour. Uh, for those of you that don't drink Guinness, it's not, you don't just pull the tap and let it go into the cup. There's an art to it. And um uh, if you've ever ordered one, it could take some time to pour uh, the perfect pint of Guinness. They used, they either use a spoon or it goes uh, on the side of the cup. I think a spoon is the, the correct way, but it, it, there is an art to it. So you definitely want to go check out the Guinness uh, storehouse and then the gravity bar on the top of it. So, and that's in Dublin. And in Dublin, there's also a ton of other pubs. And one of the most notable pubs in Dublin is the Temple Bar. Yep. And uh, have you been to the Temple Bar, Andy? I have many times. It's pretty incredible. And, and the Temple Bar is actually in this, uh, uh, this right behind me. You can see it. It was established in 1840, and it has uh, not only you know pints, but it also has one of the largest um, whiskey collections in Dublin. So, and that's, that's, a, that's a great spot. It's a well-known spot. It might be crowded, um, but rest assured, if it's too crowded, you can find another pub that's just as great um probably on many other corners oh my gosh they're, they're everywhere and like the, like i said that's that's a great example of a kind of quintessential bucket list item but there there are pubs everywhere one of the things that um i like to go is try to find like the oldest pub um in the area and actually 
one that claims to be the oldest uh, pub in Ireland is, is the Brazen Head. And that's actually right down the street from the Temple Bar. And um, there's been lots of famous people that have uh, Michael Collins. I know Garth Brooks actually Garth has Brooks. talked about being there as well. So, Garth Brooks um, actually has a song called Ireland. But he does? That's awesome. He does, yes. And it, it kind of has a melodic tone to it of uh, Irish music. It's really, it's a great song. Yeah. So you, you definitely want to do, uh, go to the Brazen Head in Dublin and that's a great start, but also just Google um, historic uh, pubs or um, oldest pubs. And then you can create your own, you know, walking pub crawl through Ireland or through Dublin, I should say. And um, we did that one year and it was, it was, it was just a lot of fun. So highly recommend it. You'll meet lots of locals and get a real feel for uh, uh, the city of Dublin, which is a, a very walkable city and a very, a very, a very fun city to go. Um, and ask your, and, and also has, ask the hotel concierge where you're staying, if they do have kind of a preset pub crawl of historic spots. And I would, I would be surprised if uh, many of them didn't have that. Yeah, for sure. For, for sure. So another thing um, I found this and I haven't done this, but I just saw it. Was so, so great. So uh, the um, there, there's an area called, um, the Wild Atlantic Way, which is on the west coast of Ireland. And um, that has uh, kind of been in traditionally the more rural area of Ireland. It's on the opposite side um, of where Dublin is. But um, there is a seaweed bath you can do in a whiskey barrel. So I thought that was just a really awesome idea. If it, you uh, just Google it, it'll come straight up. And um, you bathe in harvested seaweed. And it's um, beneficial What do they say the benefits skin. are? Yeah. Uh, skin, uh, aches, body aches, and uh, supposedly helps you sleep. So if you like one a traditional. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to fall asleep in a whiskey yeah, don't barrel. Fall asleep. Yeah, don't fall asleep in the whiskey barrel. But you might, um, maybe you just get a really good night's sleep. Like I said, I haven't done that one. But it's out there. But while you're on the West Coast, um, one of the um, fastest growing cities in Europe is Galway. Um, and Galway is a, uh, a, a Norman age town from uh, uh, way back when and has a, a rich history. If you know what the Clouder Ring is, which is the ring with the two hands and the heart, it actually was created right outside of Galway. And there's a lot of history around that. But Galway is one of those um, walkable cities, uh, very quaint, right on the ocean. And just absolutely beautiful. So if you're on the west side, make sure you you go to Galway. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, another absolutely you know amazing spot that's been um, it's it's probably some of the most famous famous pictures you'll see, and uh, it's been featured in in several films. Is the the Cliffs of Moher, and um, I've heard it not said, the Cliffs of Moher. It's not the Cliffs of Moher. It's the Cliffs of if you say it real slow, it's Moher, 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 Moher. Yeah. And, um, you know, some of the movies that have been filmed there, if you, if you, well, you can obviously just Google photos, but Harry Potter has a, a scene or two there. Uh, there was a movie Leap Year with um, Amy Adams that takes place all around Ireland. Um, but there's some scenes there. And then, of course, uh, Princess Bride. And I don't know who has Yeah, I didn't seen know that, that one. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it's just unbelievably beautiful. I think, um, Andy, I think I, your dad had a bunch of pictures from there. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely it's, gorgeous. Yeah, so it's it's really it's amazing because you can actually walk up to the edge of the cliffs and it's like a thousand feet down. I don't know if it's exactly a thousand feet, but it's pretty far. And there's no there's no fence or you know line or anything to keep you from tripping over. And the winds were like you know barreling about forty miles an hour right up there. My father was had like like was like all the way up to the edge with his, his feet hanging over the edge. I'm like, what are you doing? Get back. You're, you're making me nervous, but just an incredible, just an incredible spot. And um, something, if you have kids, just be careful while you're there, but it, it is one of those awe inspiring. You're looking out at the, the Northern Atlantic and it is just absolutely beautiful. And right over in that area too, is, are the Aran Islands and the Aran Islands are these uh, archipelago right off the uh, Western coast of Northern Ireland on the, on the Northwest coast of Ireland, I should say a fantastic easy day trip uh, to go uh, from the West coast and it has lots of, and you can even spend the night there in all these really quaint Airbnbs, but it's almost like uh, the land of time forgotten there. You go there and you really feel like you have left the modern era and gone back in time because it's much slower there, much simpler, 
and not as developed as Ireland. And that's saying, that's saying a lot, right? Because Ireland's really not developed. So highly re recommend if you do a West Coast trip of Ireland to go uh, put the Aran Islands on that bucket list. It's, it's incredible. Um, highly recommend that. Okay. And another uh, great spot that really shouldn't be missed, and it's, uh, it's more of a holy site, um, but there's a lot of legend around it. And that is Croke Patrick and Croke Patrick is a, a mountain and it's a, it's or a hill. Also, okay. But if, <laughs> if, but if you look at it, it looks like a mountain okay. and um, it's uh, approximately, you know, 2,500 feet. And um, it's also the site of a, a holy pilgrimage uh, once a year. And it's always the last Sunday of July. And you'll see, um, you know, they say thousands of um, people on this pilgrimage go up and, and for good luck, many of them will carry rocks and they put them on these cairns and, and the cairns are mountains of stones, you know, that are man-made. And there's one at what they call, I think the saddle of the mountain and that's the midway point. And then again, all the way at the top. And the legend has it that um, St. Patrick actually, and I, I, let me just be sure I get this right, is that St. Patrick was up there and he actually uh, prayed for I think it was 40 days, um, you know, that's so, so basically it's like kind of the, the Santiago del Camino where uh, people do this holy pilgrimage once a year and it's supposed to uh, yeah, but really the, be great for the soul. But the mountain itself, and I've done this, is it's only a two hour hike from the base. So it's really, really easy. So it's not um, that big of a, of a trek and pretty much anybody can do it. So I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it. The, the real traditionalists do it barefooted, but it's not recommended to do barefooted. So if you see that, we definitely recommend that you wear shoes there for sure. Yeah. And you also hear, um, you might hear it referred to as the Reek, the R-E-E-K, -E -E Reek. And um, Reek Sunday is actually that Sunday that they do the pilgrimage. So Excellent. Uh, that's actually uh, pretty interesting. So if you want to go for an event, this is one that... Um, uh, we saw and we just thought was incredible, especially for someone looking for love. And that is a um, 160 year old matchmaking festival in Luz Luzenverna. Um, it's a tiny Irish town uh, and they call it the love capital of the world. And it is a, a multi-week uh, festival that attracts people from all over the world. Um, and the festival, like I said, has been going on for 160 years. And uh, there's uh, music and dancing every night in all the bars. Uh, and from 11 a.m. in the morning to the wee hours of the night, you, um, you can look for love in all these great pubs and bars. And uh, they have organized activities. Supposedly, if you uh, uh, meet Ireland's only traditional matchmaker, his name's uh, Willie Daly, um, in his office at the matchmaker bar, um, legend has it that you will be married within six months. So if you're looking, if you're looking for love, consider um, going to the matchmaker festival. I wonder what the success rate is of a long-term marriage know. from the matchmaking festival. Uh, but it's early September every year and there's music and dancing. Um, there's a music festival that goes along with it. So boy, that sounds like fun. Um, and, okay. And one thing you guys definitely need to put on your bucket list is uh, going to Trinity college and seeing the book of Kells. Uh, the book of Kells is a, um, a book of the four gospels of the new Testament. And it's done in a very ornate way uh, back in 800 AD. And it's, absolutely pristine condition uh, is one of those libraries um, that looks like it's out of a movie and you've got this beautiful book sitting there and there's just a lot of history so to read up on it and if you're in the Dublin area uh, definitely go see the uh, book of Kells at Trinity College and Trinity College itself the campus is absolutely gorgeous so that's a great afternoon uh, uh, thing to do uh, in Dublin I was gonna Sorry. say uh, you know if why don't you tell us about the, the ring of carry um, the drive yeah, so the Ring of Kerry is in Southern Ireland, and it's, it's most arguably the one of the most beautiful uh, drives um, in Ireland, and absolutely incredible. Um, you start um, on the eastern side and kind of goes around, but it goes kind of through all the old, old, smaller towns in Southern Ireland, and it's just it's it's really, really, really gorgeous. I did it with my mom, and uh, I'll never forget. We actually got stopped that someone was hurting a bunch of goats, and the goats like kind of have the right of way there. We literally got stopped. Could not move the car, got out. There was a little pub right on the corner. Uh, we walked to the pub and then we walked into the pub and one of the goats followed us into the pub. So those are the type of experiences so, you're going to have if you go to Ireland. Um, but, so yeah, uh, the, you're talking about driving. So tell us a little bit about, okay, you, you drove. 
what was the vehicle like and what was the driving like in the countryside? You know, because it's a very small country, but it could take you quite some time to get from it one does. place it's to the other. Yeah, because there's I mean, there's some freeway, but most of it's especially like the ring. It's it's all very small, long and winding scenic roads, and some some are very well done. Some are you know back road, uh, no pavement. So you kind of run into everything when you're going through Ireland. It's actually one of the things that makes it a really great trip. Uh, but you know, traditionally the cars I've driven there are usually stick, uh, usually quite small. Um, and, um, so you want to pack light, but, uh, um, you can get a, you know, you can get a little minivan over there too, if, if, if you need to for a larger group, but, uh, to do the ring of carry is just a great way to, from a scenic drive standpoint to see the best of Ireland. So definitely you're going to hear about that as a, as a, a pretty popular thing to do. Um, and, um, it's a, it, it's a pretty long trip though. You can, you can do it. Um, in a short amount of time, but you had to kind of not stop. The better thing is, is to spend a few days and do the whole thing um, and stop and see the, all the great towns. Uh, you'll definitely get a feel for, uh, for the country. Yeah, someone actually made the recommendation that like, you know, fly into either Dublin or Shannon. And then if you flew into one, fly out of the other yep. so that you can get across the country and see a lot of it. Absolutely. I would definitely, I would definitely agree with that. And, and when you were driving, this is just a, a random, but... What was what are some of the cuisines? Does each area in Ireland do you think have a specialty dish? Is that anything that you noticed? Not really. I mean, it's it's pretty all traditional Irish fare, which is uh, you know brown meats and and potatoes and and vegetables. I think that's you know just that's the local fare. But I mean, if you go to the nicer restaurants or like to the castle um, that we talked to um, Mark about, really high end food um, and very continental. I haven't seen a whole lot of different styles in the different regions. And in Ireland is pretty much, it's a pretty small country. It's not, it's not huge. So I don't think you're going to see a lot large variance in food, but um, I think at some of the uh, more cosmopolitan cities like Galway and Dublin and Shannon, you, you will get that more continental and fine foods. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, all of these things, you know, Ireland to me is just a, uh, it's, it's just got this, this romantic quality about it. And, uh, you know, just sitting, you know, in a, in a, you know, out in the country in a small pub that has a fire and you've got a pint and there may be some sheeps outside that to me, is just such a, 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 you know, you just can't help but to want to be sitting in that chair, you know, just yeah, enjoying sure. that moment. And, uh, it seems like there's lots of moments like that around Ireland, but, um, it's definitely, you know, a bucket list country and there are many bucket list experiences, you know, within that country that, um, uh, you can't miss. It's got such a rich history. Um, it's, you know, I think, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, American history, it, you know, that doesn't date back very far, but you're looking at some of these places where, you know, the St. Patrick was, uh, you know, in 400 and in, you know, 410 or something. And uh, so the history just doesn't end. And yeah, um, it's incredible. It seems like you can excavate there and still find things. They, they talked about finding a chapel on um, uh, Coke Patrick um, that was being excavated and, and, you know, it's just fantastic it's like Roman empires. Yeah. Speaking of uh, things to hear and do, we're going to uh, be listening next to a two time uh, national storytelling champion who's going to give us a little bit of um, Irish flavor to close out the show. So stay tuned with us. Hello, and welcome back to Destination Everywhere. This is Todd Bloodworth. And I'm here with a special guest, and that guest is Martin de Gogan. Did I say that correctly? As close as anyone needs to be. Great to see you, Todd. How are you doing? You as well. Wonderful, thank you. Let's hear it from your mouth, though, with, with a proper accent. In my part of the country, we'd say Martin de Cogan. But that wouldn't be the same if you travel around the country of Ireland. Everyone has their own version of everything. Martin de Gogan. That'll do. Well, you know, by the, by the end of this, I'll get it right. And so tell us a little bit about yourself because you do have a couple of interesting facts about you. You're uh, a, a two-time storytelling champion. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Um, I grew up in uh, what's called a rambling house. Uh, my father uh, is a great bearer of the tradition. And any time a musician would pass by, there would be a party in our house and we'd have a huge dance. It'd be great crack all together. There would be, you know, all the furniture would be thrown outside. Uh, there would be tea and sandwiches for the whole place. 
and everyone would entertain everybody. So when I was young, I remember all the way back to six or seven that I would have to do my part of the entertaining in the evening. So in the house, you had to have a party piece and storytelling seemed to fall upon my shoulders. My father's a great storyteller. His um, people are all great storytellers. And so I have taken the mantle on and uh, been sharing the stories forever. So does the storytelling and the music go together? It does, it does. You know, coming, uh, coming of age in such a house, you'd have uh, all sides of uh, the tradition uh, being kind of given to you. Um, my mother brought me to every type of music lesson she could. And I was lucky that after in many years of many different instruments, I finally got it with the Irish bowron, with the drum that we have, our type of tambourine, if you will. And uh, the singing kind of came to me as well in my teenage years. And I was very lucky that I could take them and travel the world and making a living of it. I tell you, Todd, I only worked two days of my life and uh, I, I don't intend working anymore. God knows, the fellow says, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day. So, so how did you get involved in the traveling then? If you're, you're, what, what town are you from in Ireland? Well, I'm from Cork, the very south of Ireland. We have our own southern drawl. And uh, I tell you, I travel all around America. I live in San Diego and I bring bus tours to Ireland. Um, I've organized bus tours over many years uh, where we go to little out of the way places and we travel uh, with a songbook of the topography. So we sing songs of all the places that we go to and then uh, we find out the stories uh, that are to do with us, uh, the different places we visit. And I was in Cork and I said to my dad, I said, jeepers, I'd love to get something uh, about Cork, maybe some literature or something like that you know, for the people that are coming on this next bus tour. And he says, I'll bring you in to the great Seamus Heaney into the Cork Business Bureau. And Seamus Heaney, like any good Irish fella, he said, you're out in San Diego. Ah, oh, we might be in San Diego in June with the Tourism Ireland. I might give you a shout. So it's a very small world of the Irish. And uh, Seamus got me to sing songs uh, for Tourism Ireland. And um, with that, they've had me... Uh, teach the Boron at IMAX um, and to do a lot of different uh, things for them at uh, site and things like that. All these kind of uh, travel uh, expos and um, uh, around the world. But going back to Ireland is the biggest treat for me. And to say that I can bring people with me to show them where these stories lie is um, a blessing, you know? Absolutely. So, so when, when you're in Ireland, do you have a, do you have a favorite spot? Like what is your, your ideal, um, you know, getaway when, when you're back home, you know, when you're not with your family, do you, do you kind of have a bucket list thing that you, you talk about in Ireland? It's a must do for people. Yeah. I mean, I just love going down to West Cork. So Cork is the biggest County in Ireland. We're the Texas of Ireland. We just struck oil. We were a people's Republic for six months. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're a kind of a, a, a place apart, is what they call West Cork. When you go to Cork and you go down west, it's very kind of underdeveloped, if you will. And there's some beautiful, uh, pristine places that no one really goes to too often that you can kind of sneak down and take in this ancient world of heather and grass and sea air that you just don't get anywhere else, you know? That if you're going to Ireland now, Todd, you, you, get into Dublin Airport and get straight out of Dublin and go down to Cork. Yeah. You know, you're not the first person that said that. You're, you're not the first person at all. They're like, just go, get out of Dublin. But That's right. do you have a favorite pub that you go to when you're back at home? Do you know, uh, sure, there's loads of them. But if you're down in West Cork, there's a place in Clannacilty called De Barras. It's a very old pub. And uh, they have great music down there. It's a fabulous music venue. They've got great food. But it's the welcome that you get from Ray in the bars. It's fantastic, you know. Nice. You go in and, like, it's, it's very rustic, yet there's something fantastically chic about it. Would that be a right word? I don't know. Right. But you go in there and it's like stepping in into some kind of Harry Potter feeling, you know. You kind of, you're into Diagon Alley perfect. when you're into the bars. Yeah, it's fabulous. A lot, and they, a lot they, of stone. A lot of yeah, go ahead. a lot of stone, and a, you know that just that 
feeling of character that you, you can't get from a new building that when you go into the bar is down in Clannacilty and you meet the people, they might be young or old and they all have the same welcome for you, you know, it's, it's beautiful down there. Well, it's, you know, it's like the bars in America, the, the Irish bars in America. There was a trend, and I, I don't know if it's still happening, where the, the actual interior of the bar was built in Ireland, and then they would ship it and then construct it in, you know, a new building or somewhere. But you kind of had that wood and the stone, and, you know, they're trying to duplicate it, but there's nothing like the real thing, absolutely. And it's, it sounds like this is the yeah. spot I need to hit when I get there. Yeah, it's like the whole building well, wraps its arms around you as you walk in, you know? I love that. Well, and that's, let's talk a little bit about the storytelling, because we were talking, uh, you know, before we actually started recording. And, and, you know, stories, you know, obviously, you know, are a big part of Irish tradition, like you were talking about your family. You were talking about the story of, of Halloween, and, and I made the mistake of calling it an American uh, holiday. But why don't you tell us your take, uh, the Irish take on Halloween and the thin days? Well, well, Todd, you know, Ireland has a very ancient tradition and uh, our stories go way back and they would contend with any Greek or Roman set of legends uh, that would contain you for weeks upon end if you were to start it all. But the history of Halloween is centered upon a cave in Roscommon, which is at the center of the country. And in this cave, it's called Owen the Gat or the cave of the cats or some call it the gates of hell. On the thin day of when the light side of the year turns into the dark side of the year, and to explain a thin day now to the people that are listening here and watching, when the bright side of the year, that's spring and summer, change over to autumn and winter, you have a thin day both on both sides. So we have Bjaltana, which is the 1st of May, and you have Samhain, which is the 1st of November. And our seasons, because you have to kind of bring the whole thing into people, our seasons start on those quarter days. So we have Samhain on the 1st of November, right, to start uh, autumn, or uh, winter, sorry. And then uh, spring starts on the 1st of February, right, that's in black. And then we have Bjaltana, which is the start of summer, 1st of May, and then Lunasa, the 1st of August, which is the start of autumn. So you have summer and autumn in the bright side of the year and then you have winter and spring in the dark side of the year and in that change more so going from bright to dark you have a very thin veil between this world and the next and those Todd that may have been sent before their time can come back and enact vengeance upon those that sent them and so that's why in Ireland for centuries, we have been wearing a mask to cover our face for those that come back from the next world to find us out won't recognize us on the night of Halloween. And in long ago Ireland, when the sun set, that is when the day started. That's why all of the big celebrations are the night before the day that we celebrate. So the big day is Samhain, the 1st of November, but we celebrate it with a fire on the night of Halloween, on the night of the 31st of October. And if you go to a place not too far from that, it's almost directly west from this place in uh, Rathcrohan. If you're going, there's a great center there in Roscommon is where Owen the Gat is. If you go directly west onto Sligo and you go where Queen Maeve, who sat her seat, her high seat was in Rathcrohan, where she is buried, out in Sligo, right, in Caramore, in this big metallic tomb, there is a portal dolmen. That's where you have the two big stones and the one on top, right, which is weighing a couple of tons. How did they lift it? Nobody knows. But on the morning of Halloween, if you go there and it is a fine bright morning, from the hills just east of them, the sun rises and the sun goes in between the two standing stones and sets a fire ablaze with the glow of the morning sun on Halloween all around the portal dolmen to signify those that want to come back that the gates are open. So, so let's just assume I, I'm a tourist and, and I'm, I just happen to not know that this is a thing in Ireland. What could I expect to see 
on Halloween night, you know, outside of Dublin? Is it something that would shock me? Is it something no, that, you I know, mean, it's everybody's it, doing it? Is it something... You know, like the ties between America right. and Ireland are very strong, right? And sometimes you'd have the, the traveling folktale would come over and come back in a new guise. And sure, everyone's going out now with uh, American design, Chinese made costumes around the place looking for sweets, <laughs> right? But what we do have, and, and there's a great festival in Trim Castle, we have the Dracula Festival, because you know uh, Count Dracula, right? Everyone thinks it was Val the Impaler from the f uh, eastern part of Europe. It's actually an old Irish legend from County Derry. And uh, Bram Stoker, he grew up in Dublin, and uh, he was a great friend of Oscar Wilde, and he used to sit with Oscar Wilde's mother, who was a great antiquarian and historian, and a fabulous storyteller. And uh, she would tell stories, along with his own mother, Bram Stoker's mother, who grew up, uh, I think she was from Sligo as well. She grew up during the time of the famine. And the famine, they used to call it the Druffwil, the bad blood. Druffwil, that's the, or Druffwil, that's the Irish for bad blood. Druffwil, or Dracula. And so there's a legend that was printed in book by a fella Patrick Western Joyce, who was a cousin of James Joyce, and he wrote this legend uh, 12 years before that Dracula was published about a fella Arvatart up in Derry, where Bram Stoker's father was from. And in this place in Derry, there is the legend that in the 5th century, a tyrant and a dwarf and a magician was out killing the people and drinking their blood. So the local chieftain went and killed him, slayed him and placed him into the ground. But the following night, he was out again looking for a bowl of blood. The chieftain got the neighbouring chieftain and killed him again and buried him standing up. But yet he came back a third time. The chieftain seeked out a druid to see what he might say. And the druid said that if you would make a spear out of a yew tree and place it through the heart of the dwarf Arvatacht, bury him upside down and place a massive slab over his tomb, you'd never see him again. And with that, they buried him upside down and placed a slab over him and got the white thorn tree and threw its brambles around the slab and still today, in a very, very good field for growing crops, right, you have a massive slab in the middle of this farmer's field with a white thorn tree coming out of it. And a professor, Bob Curran, from uh, Queen's University, Belfast, went in 2000 to seek it out. And if he did, he slipped on it and his back was sore for months after. They went to chop down that tree and men went down with a brand new chainsaw and it didn't work. He tried it over and over again. The chainsaw wouldn't work. And they went back with a second chainsaw and it still wouldn't work. And it's still there today for anyone to visit. But I tell you, Todd, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> that's, that's, I, I mean, you can sit there and I'm, I, I, your brain starts going in different directions when you're hearing the stories because you don't know what's going to happen next. But you're a great storyteller. There's no doubt about that. Um, and Thanks as a storyteller, I, I want to know what is, uh, you know, again, let's, let's go back to St. Patrick's Day for a second. And this will be the last thing I ask you. So tell me the story of St. Patrick's Day as an Irishman. Uh, you know, I know what we've become, you know, in, in the States of, of, you know, when it comes to, to St. Patrick's Day. But uh, it's, it's different when you're in Ireland. And uh, it's not, it's not, you know, everybody dressed in green, you know, throw shamrocks all over the place and, uh, you know, go out and drink beer for an entire day and have a couple of parades. What, what does St. A, a Patrick's Day mean in Ireland? Well, Todd, you know, in my lifetime, St. Patrick's Day has changed quite a lot in Ireland. When I grew up, of course, we were... Uh, a very poor country at that time when I was born. That was in the last century now. And during this time, St. Patrick's, they would fall in the time of Lent. That's the time before Easter when uh, most of the country would have given up chocolate 
uh, for the sake of our Saviour. And we wouldn't eat sweets for the whole seven weeks of Lent, especially as a child. And on that day, you could break your fast. So there was a huge celebration of chocolate. And as well, you'd go to Mass in the morning, you'd wear shamrock on your, on your lapel or on your shirt, and there would be a parade inside in the city, in Cork City. And I was often in the parade myself. And it was a very nice kind of quiet parade in comparison to what you might have now uh, going down Fifth Avenue in New York. Uh, but, you know, the idea of St. Patrick's Day started in New York and then spread up to Canada. Uh, the idea of celebrating with a parade, I should say, started in New York and went up to Canada and then has traveled all around the world. And nowadays, uh, of course, St. Patrick's Day, everyone is Irish in St. Patrick. You go down to Peru, over to India, Australia, New Zealand, everyone is Irish on St. Patrick's Day. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful, uh, you know, celebration just to let your hair down in the middle of that time of the year. And of course, it falls on uh, the equinox of spring you know you'd have the high tides of spring but nowadays you know it's a national holiday people take the day off uh, and it's a big celebration in ireland you know it may not be as big as chicago or new york or san diego but the parades are big in ireland and they're small like in my town of carrigaline it's a population of about sixteen thousand people they have their own parade and it's beautiful you know there's uh, small towns that celebrate having the smallest parades in the world. Uh, and that's a big celebration for them, you know. So people really do have the crack. And if you're going to go to Ireland around St. Patrick's Day, the place is full of crack. And that's not stuff you're going to buy on the street. This is stuff that only happens uh, among the Irish. Uh, crack is how we have fun uh, without buying stuff on the street now, if you're still with me. But the idea of having the crack when you go to Ireland uh, that's what they'll tell you, that what's the crack, how's the crack, where's the crack. That's what we say for having fun in Ireland. Well, that's great. Well, Martin, you know, that's really, that's all the time we have. But I mean, I, I could, you know, talk to you forever because you're such a great, you know, you're a dynamic speaker and a great storyteller. Um, but if anybody wants to get a hold of you or wants any information about you, where can they, where can they track you down? Well, uh, my website is open every day of the year, Christmas Day. Halloween, Easter, and that's at uh, www.martinmusic.com. And there's two I's in Martin, M-A-I-R-T-I-N, music, spelled the same everywhere, dot com. And uh, they can find out all the information, more or less, there. Well, Martin, again, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for sharing with our listeners a little bit more about the history and some of the storytelling in Ireland. And with that, you know, we will be right back. So again, thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Martin. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Todd. Welcome back, everyone, to Destination Everywhere, our Ireland edition. And we're so excited to share with you all the great things that we've learned about Ireland and experienced there. I mean, Todd, there's so many things to do. I mean, you could go back. I've been, like I said, at the beginning of the show, nine or 10 times, and it's just been an incredible experience each time. What were some of the things that, that you definitely want to put on your bucket list? Oh, without a doubt, Dromolin Castle. I just, I mean, the place is absolutely amazing. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, just the activities they have on site. Um, but, you know, just the pubs, I just want to get a car and go drive around the countryside and, and just stop in random spots and, and check them out. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't think you can lose. You can't lose. I, I think, you know, for me, um, you know, my family is, is from the, the western part of Ireland. I've spent a lot of time there. I think, you know, flying into Shannon and heading north into Galway, um, into the Donegal area, there's beautiful beaches there. Uh, there's so much to do. Um, uh, you know, the castles right there, there's lots of different castles that you can actually stay in. Um, uh, some are just absolutely stunning, and we have not spent any time talking about golf this entire this entire show. Uh, we didn't even have time to talk about how much golf you can do in Ireland. So if you're a golf aficionado or if that's your sport, it's definitely a place to put on your bucket list. You will get the most amazing views. Um, well, and, there, and, and we we did mention that there is that championship eighteen hole golf course at Dromolin Castle. So uh, do remember yeah. that. So great. Well, thanks everybody. We will see you next time. We are excited to bring you all these great destinations. For Todd Bloodworth, I'm Andy McNeil. 
Thanks for joining us on Destination Everywhere. You've just tuned in to another episode of Destination Everywhere with travel and hospitality entrepreneurs, Todd Bloodworth and Andy McNeil. To access the show notes and other helpful resources, visit destination-everywhere.com. Join us again next week for another bucket list filled show as we feature another travel worthy destination. Until next time, travel well and be safe out there.